yourself this week. I promise you this week someone will say something to you and you'll be tempted to just look at them and go, stop it. Wow, I all of a sudden got 400 birthday notices. That's nice. Yeah, stop it or I'll bury you in a box. Yeah, you don't have to say that. Part. Good to see you guys this morning. Today, can you believe it's Thanksgiving week already? So let me tell you something about the holidays that I know and you know, but you think no one else knows. Okay, so I'm going to tell on everyone in this room. So if you're ready, here it is. A lot of people, a lot of people struggle with sadness this time of year. Sadness for loss. Sadness for things they wish were different. There's a lot of different reasons and and people struggle. Many, 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 many people struggle with sadness. And the message today as we talk about practicing gratefulness, it won't take the sadness away. I, I would love to tell you that there's a magic formula, do these six things and you won't be sad. But it will help you. Uh, and I would encourage you, even for some of you, you need to face the sadness, embrace the sadness, and say, this is why I'm sad. And even say to God, God, I'm sad because of this, and I don't like it. And I know that some of you have looked in the mirror when it comes to that, and you've said, stop it. Don't be this way. But there's other things in life that you can let go of that you can stop and um and so we're going to look at because when i used to do a thanksgiving message all i used to talk about was how to be thankful and as i'm getting older and older and older i realize that for some people it's not that they don't know how to be thankful but they have so many other things that they, they cannot put down in order to pick up thankfulness and gratefulness. So we're going to look at that today. This will be a fairly short message overall. I hate to say that because then you'll be timing me. Um, but we're going to talk about practicing gratefulness. And here's what I want you to know. God wants you to let go of some things so that you can embrace other things and you can be grateful. So that's the two parts of the message. And we're going to start with this idea. Three things that you must let go of to be grateful. You ready? You buckled in? No? You guys ready? Yes. All right, here we go. Number one, don't focus on what other people are doing. Now, I've been a pastor a long time, a youth pastor, all this other stuff, worked in churches for years. I want to tell you something, this has always been a struggle in churches, especially among teams and groups of people that are together a lot, because we have a tendency as humans to compare, but it has become more of a problem in the last about 10 years with this thing called Facebook, because when we look at Facebook, we see people's favorite pictures, and I love what people are doing now. They are now getting professional photographs taken. And instead of choosing the best picture, they're going through all their photos and saying, which one of these is the absolute most horrible picture? That will be our Christmas card. So you've got ones with kids screaming and punching dad in the face and babies going to the restroom. I mean, just, just horrible Christmas cards. And they're hilarious. But if you and I aren't careful, we will look at people's pictures on Facebook, we'll look at the image they project, and we will say, why isn't my life like their life? Why do they deserve something? Why do I suffer more than that person suffers? And I want to tell you, you're not alone in that either. Luke chapter 10, Jesus, uh, uh, it's a Jesus story. Here we go. While Jesus and his followers were traveling, Jesus went into a town. A woman named Martha let Jesus stay at her house. Scandalous. Martha had a sister named Mary who was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him teach. But Martha 
was busy. By the way, one of the biggest things this time of year, if you're not careful, you will get busy. And busy can make you grumpy. Busy with all the work to be done, she went in and said, Lord, I love this, don't you care? Time out right there. We do that all the time. We do that all the time. When we see somebody and their life seems to be going better, or we seem to have sickness and they don't, and, or we have one trial after another trial after another trial, and we look at other people and they seem to have this picture-perfect life, and they have this or they have that, and we compare ourselves and we say, Lord, don't you care? I deserve to have as good of a life as they have, and we get busy comparing ourselves, and you cannot be grateful while you are comparing and then he says, don't you care, she says, that my sister has left me alone. By the way, that's the other way that we feel. When you compare yourself to other people, you think that they're not lonely, but you are. You look at them and you think because they're married and because they have kids. Did you know one out of three married people admits to feeling lonely frequently? So those of you who are single today, I want you to know, you are not alone. There's a married person sitting here that when I said that said, uh-huh. Has left me alone to do all the work. By the way, we always like to compare the amount of things we do to the amount of things other people do. And at churches, it gets to be funny because uh, uh, even the pastor can do that if he's not careful. I'll compare myself to other people and go, well, I did this. People that set up chairs sometimes go, I'm the only one setting up chairs. I'm the only one mopping. I'm the only one. And the enemy wants you to think you're the only one. Poor you. <laughs> Don't you care? My sister left me alone to do the work and then tell her to help me. By the way, when that happens, you begin to become demanding of God. Listen, Jesus, God's son, God incarnate is sitting in her house. She invited him over and was paying no attention to him. You can do all the right things. You can pretend you're as spiritual as you want to be. You can come to church and think nothing about God. You can have Jesus in your house. You might have a house that has the walls. Maybe you have a big portrait of Jesus. Probably doesn't look like your portrait, by the way. And totally miss him. And get so busy working and doing things for Jesus that you don't even notice that he's there. Or you're so busy comparing yourself, your life to everyone else's life, that you begin to be unhappy with your life because you think, I should be like them. Even worse, some of you have been hurt. Somebody's hurt you. Somebody's left you, abandoned you, lied about you, backstabbed you, done something to you, and you have a right to be mad. By the way, four weeks ago I talked about forgiveness. You have to listen to that one. But you have a right to be upset. And if you're not careful, even as you're sitting here today and I say that, you think of that person and you think, I wonder what they're doing right now. Why are they being blessed? They should suffer. I actually had somebody who did something to me, and one of my good Christian friends, a good person, said to me, you know, they're going to die early from that. <laughs> they're going to get cancer. I think it's what they know. Well, what? I don't want God to do that to me when I blow it. So, uh, no, they don't need to do it. They can live forever. It's all good. They can live as an example of what not to do. God, just make them live as a non-example to other people how not to live. And so, if, but if we're not careful, we'll go through life and we'll actually think of people who hurt us and think, well, I hope that they don't do well. You may have not seen them in years. And can I tell you a secret? They're not thinking about you at all. They haven't thought about you in years and you still bring them up. You're the only one keeping them alive in your life. Push them out. Quit comparing in the Bible, it talks about us running our own race. Can I encourage you to run your own race? Your first prayer today to let go should be, God, 
Would you forgive me for comparing myself to other people? God's given you gifts and talents and a temperament that no one else has, but he, he is not going to make you like someone else. He's not going to make your life like their life. So quit it. Stop it. And ask God to forgive you for doing that. Number two, let go of things you can't control. Now, I know some of you are sitting there. So as soon as I, and I did this on purpose, because I know some of you are sitting there going, you know, Eric, I know the answer to that one. <laughs> Eric, let me teach you a lesson, because I know in your naivete, you don't realize we can't control anything. Right. That's the point. You can't. Now, every once in a while, you can control your breathing. Did you know that? So right now, I want to encourage you to take a deep breath. But you know, if you get sick, you can't control your breathing. You know, if you have an asthma attack, you can't, you can't even control that. You are in control of very little. And, and let me tell you something. This week, I saw this great video about how children need vitamin N. Yes, they need vitamin N. A lot of kids are, are short of vitamin N, and it's causing them to be selfish and self-centered because of this vitamin N. It's causing them to think the world revolves around them. It's causing them to be lazy. They don't think they have to do anything, and they'll get whatever they want because not enough parents are saying no. I don't want to deny my kid anything, and we're causing them. And here's what they've discovered. The children who are not told no are actually less happy more depressed, struggle more with depression and discouragement. And we as parents think we're doing a favor. I just give them whatever they want. Oh, you broke your phone? I'll get you a new one. You broke your Nintendo? Well, actually, game, whatever thing. Uh, I'll get you a new one. You broke your, you know, NES or whatever they got now? I'll get you a new one. And we, and we don't look at kids and go, no, you're not getting that for Christmas. And we go into debt. And we spend money that we don't have because we're afraid, oh, no, I don't want to hurt their feelings. And what we're doing... Do you like how I said that? <laughs> but we've got to realize that if we don't teach their kids that they can't control everything, we are hurting them. In Philippians 4, it says this. Do not be anxious about anything. How are you doing on that one? By the way, anxiety sometimes just attacks you. This is not talking about not having that. Oh, oh. But then what do you do? But in everything, by prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and what will happen? The peace of God, which transcends understanding, which means you don't always understand why you have peace, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This week I got a call. I have a friend that's 50, about 55. And uh, I just saw him a few weeks ago, went to breakfast. They said, uh, hey, he's in the hospital. He's in a coma. What? What happened? We don't know. His sugar, at that point they said 1,500. Now the doctor said it was over 2,000. I didn't even know you could live through. The doctor even said, I didn't know you could live through 2,000. The, the machines couldn't pick it up. They had to do the final blood test to know that it was above 2,000. He's still in a coma. I just talked to him the other day. Hey, guess what we can control in life? Nothing. Nothing. Take a breath. Okay, you got that. Here's the problem. You and I are so busy trying to control everything that we get more and more stressed out, and you can't even enjoy life because you're so busy trying to control it. So pray, God, remind me that I'm not in charge. God, remind me that I'm not in control. And would you do me a favor? Spouses, you're going to love this. Tell the person next to you, you are not in control. Ready? Go. I'm not sure one couple just kissed after saying that. I'm not sure. I'm guessing they had a fight on the way to church, but, you know, that's not me to judge. I'm not here to judge. <laughs> and you really can't control your spouse, okay? So those of you, if you have a teenager, you figure out real quick, you thought you could control your kids, and then they hit 12, and you went, what? Number three. This one's much easier to say than to do, and it's much easier to tell this to other people than yourself. Don't worry about your future. 
Matthew 6, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more important than food? And some of you are like, And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. By the way, when's the last time you looked at the birds? That's some awesome birds. Did you know people come from all over the world to, to this area to see birds? Well, that too. That too. I've driven behind a lot of them this week. They don't sow or reap or stow in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour of his life? And we know the truth. By worrying, we reduce the hours of our lives. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Not even one of Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. So can you trust your future to God? Corey Ten Moon used to say, I can trust an unknown future. I can't remember the rest of it. To a known God. I just, it's not exactly what she said. She said it a lot better. It was really good. So I can trust an unknown future. And you can trust an unknown future to a God who loves you. He's already gone before you. You can't trust him. But do you trust him? When Ricky was in, in uh, the NICU, the ICU unit over at Florida Hospital, he was about two days old. And they told us he wasn't looking good. His blood pressure was bad. He wasn't breathing right. They had him on full oxygen. And uh, I remember sitting out by the lake by Florida Hospital and saying, Lord, you gave me my son. If you only want me to have him for two or three days, that's your choice. He's your child. And that was not an easy prayer to pray. In two days, he'll be playing his first high school basketball game for Titusville High School. So... But I want you to know something I've realized with all my children. They're not mine. They've been lent to me by God. Yes. My daughter from Taiwan was given to me by God. My, my daughter with Down syndrome was given to me by God. My older son, okay, it was God. <laughs> <laughs> He's in this service. <laughs> but, but the truth is that you know, we have to quit thinking that we have possession of things and realize my things, my stuff, my car, my life, my house, my family was given to me by God. God, every moment you want me to enjoy them, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to live in these moments. So choose to live today. And sometimes you'll need to pray, God, I'm trying to live tomorrow. Help me to live today. And listen, when you're, I know what happens. You're praying and you're looking at that obstacle that's coming up and you're praying, oh, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm going to, and then you avoid that obstacle. And instead of saying, God, thank you for that, we tend to go to the next obstacle and worry about that one. Hey, Thanksgiving happened uh, the main time. Listen, I know George Washington talked about it, but Lincoln really instituted it during the Civil War. During one of the worst times in American history, we were literally killing thousands based on our political and racist and everything else beliefs. And he said, but it's time to give thanks. Can you give thanks? Can you give thanks this time of year? I don't care who you voted for. Amen. When we get to heaven, I, I'm not going to look. I'm, you're not going to have a sign in your yard. <laughs> your your sign's going to say, I voted for Jesus. Amen. And there we are. Right. Number three. Oh, sorry. Yes, I went there. All right, number three. <laughs> three things you can embrace to be grateful. Here's three things I want you to embrace. Number one, and buckle in because this one's painful. Live a life of worship. So the story continues, but the Lord answered her. Remember Martha, you know, Jesus, tell her to help me. I'm doing this all by myself. Thank you. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is important. Mary has chosen the better thing, and it will never be taken away from her. Now here's the truth. Martha could have worked and worshipped at the same time, but she didn't. Because she was too busy comparing. And God called her to worship in whatever she did. Now buckle up. This is where God convicted me. And so you get to ride on this ride with me. So God said, Eric, God, do you worship me in your driving? <laughs> no, I worship me in my driving. Because when I'm driving, this is the kingdom of Eric. And those of you who violate the kingdom of Eric, 
you are tailgating me and you are messing with the kingdom of Eric. And the kingdom of Eric wants to hit his brakes and impact your kingdom and show you who is more important. Or if you're going too slow because you're a snowbird and yesterday I'm headed to the hospital and you are going 30 miles an hour in a 45 on US-1 and I'm thinking, hey, the kingdom of Eric has got to get to the hospital and so you people who are not admonishing and loving the kingdom of Eric, you have a problem and we would like to tailgate you now to show you that you need to speed up because the kingdom of Eric is coming through. Somebody posted on their Facebook this week that they couldn't stand all the slow drivers and they were slowing them down, driving them both lanes. And I said, you know what? It could just be your guardian angels trying to keep you from another accident. And when you and I get to heaven, we might get this talk. Hey, Eric, come in. You remember that day you were in a hurry to the hospital because your friend was up there and you thought you were going to hurry up there? I sent two people, two people. Those were angels. They were not people. I know I put, I, I know I put uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin tags and stickers that said Snowbird and, and Great Outdoors, you know, on their thing. But, but those were my guys. And they were keeping you from an accident further up the road. So, hey, I want a little thank you, and I want you to apologize to them. No, I'm not. No. We drive like it's our kingdom. Okay, so you ready? Now buckle in. This gets worse. It gets worse because you're sitting there. You're going, Eric, I'm so glad I don't struggle. <laughs> okay. Anytime you yell at somebody because they don't do what you want, you're not worshiping. You're worshiping you. And they didn't worship you, and so you got angry. Because they didn't worship you. They didn't bow at your feet. They didn't do what you wanted to do when you wanted them to do it. And how dare they? Now, I'm not saying you can't have boundaries. You can have boundaries. But do you have boundaries because you love the person or because you love yourself? Do you know what the worst kind of discipline in homes is? Is parents who only discipline their children when they're bothered. And what you're telling your children is, when you mess with the kingdom of me, I come down hard on you. When you give good boundaries, you teach your children that it's not about you and it's not even about them. It's about respecting and loving each other because there's only two commands, love God and love people. So anytime you yell, whether it's in person or on Facebook, because you've got to tell your way of doing things, you're saying, worship me, I'm here. And if you think that's a new thing, Adam and Eve, when Satan came to them, you know, Satan came to them and he said, hey, hey, listen, I got another way. Instead of worshiping God, you guys can be right up there. Good idea. And we still struggle with that. And every time you find yourself irritated, it's the worship me. I got it. This is my kingdom. How dare you mess with it? So I want to encourage you this week. When you find yourself ungrateful or unthankful, or especially when you find yourself angry, remind yourself of who you should be worshiping. And say, God, you know what? I realize that when I get angry like this, it means I'm worshiping me. I think life is about me. Forgive me. It's not about me. It's about you. And if you come to my house on my mirror in large letters, it says, it's not about you. So just for fun, would you tell the person next to them it's not about them? Go ahead. It's not about you. Go ahead. Number two, here we go. Take time to give thanks for your blessings. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. When Jesus saw them, he healed these men. They took off. He said, go show yourself to a priest. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. They point that out on purpose. They, they didn't have the same rights as Jews. Long story about that. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So all these guys were healed, but only one came back. Only one came back. You know why? I think there's two reasons. Number one, we get busy. I think we get busy so that even when God blesses us, we forget about it. And we forget to thank him for what he helped us through. And so Thanksgiving's a time to stop and thank him for what we've survived. You know the other reason? Because we think 
that the world owes us something. God owes us something. So I made a list here. It took me all morning. I made a list of all the things that the world owes you. The second page looks very similar to this one. Guys, nobody owes you a thing. God doesn't owe you a thing. And yet he gave you his love and forgiveness. There are times that life is difficult. When life is difficult, remember that Jesus went to the cross. When life is hard and you say, I don't know why my life is hard. Welcome to the cross. Jesus never said it would be easy. He actually said sometimes it would be difficult. But he also said he would be with us. So if nothing else, you could thank him that he's with you on those days. Finally, number three, focus on doing God's will for you each day. Do me a favor. I want you to take a deep breath again. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, if you were able to breathe, God still has a purpose for you today. I remember visiting my mentor, Dave Daniel, in the nursing home with a type of Lou Gehrig's disease. He got weaker and weaker. Near the end, he got where he could not speak, could not move, could not walk. I remember the guy coming in to help him, came in and he said, you know, he smiles at me still. He got to the point where he couldn't do anything but smile, but that smile was a blessing to that man. If God can use a smile as long as you're breathing, God can use you. But you've got to pay attention today. Since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, I love this visual, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back. I'm not talking about, I mean, he's, he's relating it to the Olympics back then. And especially those sins that wrap themselves tightly around our feet. By the way, sin is any time you say, worship me, I worship pleasure, I worship sin. And that will keep you from being grateful and thankful because you're saying the world's about me. So you've got to take those things off and let us run with patience. That word patience is the same word that's used in weddings. Love is patient, which we know when we say love is patient, we mean long Suffering. So the next time you go to a wedding, they read 1 Corinthians 13. When they say, love is patient, here's what I want you to hear. Long suffering. <laughs> it means that you're willing to fight through the hard things. You're willing to go through the difficulty. You're willing to go through the pain. The Bible says, we well, you got a race to run, and there will be times that it will be painful. And I believe a lot of people don't accomplish what God wants to accomplish in their lives because as soon as it gets hard, they quit. As soon as it gets difficult or they don't get their way or they don't get what they want, they stop. I'm done. And I cannot tell you the number of times as a pastor of a church, I've watched people who said, oh, I really want to serve Jesus. And they start serving and somebody doesn't respond the way they think they should respond. Things don't go the way they think they go. And all of a sudden they go, ah, quit. Why? Because it's their kingdom. You ever say I'm the only one that does whatever at your house? I'm the only one that washes dishes at this workplace. I'm the only one who comes in on time. Nobody else, right? Why do we do that? Because we're focused on other people instead of saying, God, what do you want me to do today? Let's run with patience. And then it says the particular race. That means your race, not their race. Quit comparing yourself to other people that God has set before us. So can you seek his kingdom every day, every moment, even today? Did you know you saying hi to somebody here may be exactly what they needed to hear? You giving someone a hug this morning may be just what they needed. You not giving a paranoid person a hug may be exactly what they needed this morning. Oh, fist bump. There you go. All right. You know, Howie Mandel comes to our church. Don't hug him. Don't hug him. Right? You, even with those little things that may be just how God brings the kingdom into life. You going out of your way to call somebody this time of year. When you feel sad and you don't feel like doing a thing, that's the best time to suffer and go out of your way to ask someone else about their day. Ask somebody else how they're doing. Find out what you can do for them instead of just thinking about you. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God wants you this time of year to let go of things and embrace gratefulness 
and thankfulness. Here's some practical steps. Ask God to help you. Thank someone for what they've done. No matter what you're going through today, take time today, whether it's a Facebook note or a text or whatever, and just thank somebody for what they've done for you. I wrote a, a teacher from years ago recently, and a friend of theirs actually texted me and let me know that that was perfect timing. Pay attention to your stinking thinking. We tend to think of the negative and what's wrong and what's wrong and what's wrong and what's wrong. Turn off the news, please. And begin to look for the good. The answer. Take time to be grateful and thankful to God for specific things. If you need to, go outside look around. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Look at the stuff. Thank God for electricity. After Hurricane Andrew, they didn't have electricity for months. I think everybody's got theirs back. Anybody here without? Live and give thanks in the moments. You can only live and love in this moment. So do it. Don't wait for the next one. Don't sit and regret the last one. Just love in this one and give thanks. That's what Thanksgiving is about today. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can surrender to him today. You can worship him instead of you. You're not a very good God. So maybe you want to give up today. Give up your life and say, I want to live for Jesus. Come to me after the service. I'd love to talk to you about that, what that means. If you're here today and you are a believer, I want to encourage you in the moments to say, God, what do you want me to do? We're going to have our time of giving. As you give this morning, give thanks. Say, God, I can't control my money. Obviously, it's almost Christmas. I really can't control my money. But I'm going to give part of it to you as an offering to worship you today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you. Lord, for people watching online who are maybe discouraged, that couldn't even come to church because they're so discouraged, I want to pray right now that you would reach into their homes, into their cars, wherever they are, Father, and let them know they are not alone being lonely and that you are with them. They are not alone. And Father, I thank you for that, for each one here in this service, that even when they feel most alone, that they would know your presence. Father, I pray also for anyone here who doesn't know you or anyone watching online that doesn't know you, that today would be the day that they surrender to you. And Father, we love you. Thank you for a church that loves people and loves you. Father, continue to work in our midst. Bless our giving now, Lord. I pray it would go to help people around the world. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of boxes. I pray each of those boxes would change a life. In Jesus' name, amen. Have our time of giving.